اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم I start off in the name of Allah who is the most beneficent and the most merciful I seek salvation from shaitan the accursed My dear brothers and sisters from all across the world I, I greet you with the greatest of greetings Assalamu alaikum jameean wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May the peace, blessings and protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be with you at every step of your journey through this month. I would like to welcome you to another edition of the Ramadan show exclusively here on Imam Hussain TV with me, your host, Dr. Shabir Tijani. Inshallah, we hope that you join in with this show by joining us on social media, on Twitter using the hashtag IHTV Ramadan, on Facebook, on Instagram and on YouTube. Please also don't forget to send in your videos from around the world, from where you are, to show us how you prepare for the month of Ramadan. Before uh, going and commencing on to the rest of the show, I want to share a hadith with you from Imam Hussain alayhi salam, where he says, the ultimate form of showing mercy from one human being to another is being able to forgive another person when you have the ability to punish them or to take revenge. Surely this is a message that we must remember through this month where forgiveness is a very noble trait, a noble thing to have in order for you to be shack free from the shackles of hatred and to be able to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In today's segment, when we're talking about spiritual refinement, I want to focus on a specific trait, a way of thinking that you can develop in order to achieve perfection, to complete your journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the importance of self-knowledge. <clears throat> in Arabic, the term for self-knowledge is ma'rifatul nafs which directly into English translates as knowledge of oneself or importance of self-knowledge. But when I talk about that, what do I mean by self-knowledge? I don't mean the cognitive and the physical self-knowledge where you know your name, where you live, the country that you were born in, other aspects of your day-to-day -day life, but rather the spiritual dimension of your life. When we speak of the different dimensions of the spirit and of our being, don't forget that the human being is fundamentally different to all other sorts of beings. Even though physically, the scientists have shown that we are just another animal, we have facets to our being, to our makeup, that make us very unique from other animals. This, these, be, these facets, these, these important qualities, the most important of all is the, the rational thinking that we have the ability to tell good from bad, from right from wrong and it doesn't exist in any other animal apart from the human being. To understand the importance of self-knowledge it is important to have a look at the greatest book of all, the Holy Quran and there is inferences from the Quran, specific verses that we can look at in order to give us a better idea of exactly what the self-knowledge, the importance of self-knowledge is. In Surah Hashr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And be not like those who forget Allah, so He made them forget their own souls. These, it is that they are transgressors. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that forgetting Him causes one to forget themselves in, in turn. And ultimately, the person that forgets themselves becomes a transgressor. There's a tradition that makes a similar point to that of this verse. 
but looks at it from a slightly different angle. When you read the books of ethics, you will not find many books written without this quotation. And it says, he who tr truly knows himself has known his Lord. If you think about the profanity, the, the, the profound depth of this statement, you understand that the importance of understanding yourself is a path towards God himself. Awareness of oneself leads to awareness of his Lord. And likewise, the one who is oblivious of his Lord is oblivious of himself. And the person who is determined to learn about his Lord, the first step on that conquest is learning about yourself. From the Holy Quran, Surah Ma'idah says, O oh, you who believe, take care of yourselves. He who errs cannot hurt you when you are right, sorry, when you're on the right path. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us to take care of ourselves, to pay attention to ourselves, and to be careful of the well-being of our spirits. Because when we're aware of the knowledge that we have, if we're aware of the spirit that we have, our souls, we pick up very quickly on the diseases of that soul. Because you see, when you are at one with your soul, and if you're at one with your inert being, your intrinsic being, you become very, very quickly aware when something's not quite right, when the balance isn't right. And that is when you identify the diseases of your soul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us what traits we should stay away from, what things we should not do. And on the contrary, He's also told us things that we should try to do in order to achieve spiritual enlightenment and closeness to Him. Sometimes a question may arise about the rela relationship between the believer and the society that he lives in. Does that mean that the verse tells us that we should focus on ourselves and not pay attention to society as a whole? To answer this question, Allama Taba Tabai expands on this topic in his book Al-Mizan. For those of you who do not know who Allama Taba Tabai is, He's one of the greatest scholars who has written or had written a book which interprets the verses of the Holy Quran, it's a tafsir. And he explains what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is writing or is saying in the Holy Quran. And he tries to expand upon the verses in order to see, in order to use those verses and be able to implement those verses in our day to day life, not only on a personal basis but also how we can affect society at large. For instance, in Islam, we're commanded to advise people to do good and refrain from evil. One who does not perform this duty is not considered to be a devout Muslim because it is incumbent upon us all to do that. So the reason that is not helping the society to better itself, that person cannot be considered a Muslim. A verse of the Holy Quran which also emphasizes the importance of self-knowledge. It says, we will soon show them our signs in the universe and in their own souls until it becomes quite clear to them that it is the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, very soon we will show them our signs. But what is he talking about when he talks about our signs and where can we find them? These signs are found in two places, meaning the extrinsic or the external world and the intrinsic world within our own souls. The ayah tells us that by looking at these signs, contemplating on these signs, which exist all around us, but also exist within our souls, we can achieve closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we'll be able to see the proof of His existence very, very clearly through that. Self-knowledge doesn't mean that we should purely focus on just our souls. Surely the world around us, society at large, has been created for us, for us to partake in. We have a role to play within this world, within society, within even this materialistic world. Let's face it, the person who has a living, who either works as a scientist or a doctor, works in the laboratory, works in the hospital, or even if they have a menial job, they work out anywhere in this world. 
they're earning an honorable living, they're able to feed their family, and through that they're able to give back to society. It is again one of the most distinctive, distinctive characteristics of Islam that the two worlds are never separated. You have a role to play in this world, and through the role you play in this world, it will affect what happens to you in the hereafter. In this Western world that we live in, uh, well, in Western society in particular, in this world that we live in, we see countless examples of people who totally alienate themselves in one way or the other. Especially in the Western world, we find people who are so submersed within the materialistic world that they lose sight of their inert being, their intrinsic being. It is very important to make sure that you have a balance. Very important to be at one with your soul and not to get too caught up in this materialistic world. Amir al-Mu'mineen says, I wonder at that person who urgently seeks and searches for that which he has lost, but he has lost his soul and is not searching for it. He also says the ultimate knowledge of a man is to know himself. As we can see from the verses of the Qur'an and from the sayings of the Aima alayhi salam, we find that seeking or trying to find yourself is one of the first steps to trying to find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let's pray that during this month, whilst we're sitting down, contemplating, reflecting, philosophizing, reassessing our lives, within those time frames, within those moments, we find brief glimpses into our souls, into the inert being, intrinsic beings that we are. And when we do that, we will see a reflection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can see the bounties that He's bestowed upon us. And by doing that, we can get closest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Imam Ali ibn Musa al riva alayhi salatu was salam has said, Someone who recites one verse from the Book of Allah, the Mighty, the Glorious, in the month of Ramadan, is like one who has recited the entire Qur'an in the other months. During the process, during these episodes in the month of Ramadan, I've been trying to look at different parts of the world and how people from all over the world celebrate or rather prepare for the month of Ramadan, prepare their day-to-day -day lives for the month of Ramadan and how it differs from different countries, different cities around the world. Today we'll be talking about Tehran. Tehran is the capital city in the country of Iran. And once I've been, well, when I've been researching into how the Tehranis have a subtly different routine day to day in the month of Ramadan, I've come across a few things which I thought I'd share with you. As I've said before, Tehran's a very, very busy city. Outside the month of Ramadan, the people, the Tehranis, tend to work long, long hours. Shops open at 9 in the morning, open through the course of the day and close sometimes at 10 or 11 o'clock at night. However, during the month of Ramadan, the opening hours of the shops are very small of, or much less and they close by 5 p.m. in the evening. The Tehranis, they tend to all go to the mosque for iftar, so one hour before the time of sunset, if you go out into the roads, you will see that the roads are absolutely jam-packed with cars as people are trying to make their way home or they're trying to make their way to the mosques in time for the iftar. And once they get to the mosques, the communities as a whole, they tend to have iftar together so that they can enjoy in the food, they can build brotherhood and sisterhood within the confines of the mosque. Even though compared to some of the more religious cities in Iran, Tehran is actually considered, compared to cities such as Mashhad or Qum, to be less religious. However, even in this month, all of the people endeavor and make the utmost effort to go to the mosques. 
we see that majlis starts at the time of iftar, sometimes at about 9 o'clock and it goes on until the time of Fajr. They have long, long programs which include dua, lectures, they have a'mal on the specific nights where it's recommended to have a'mal and they also get together as a community and as a result they build strong bonds within the communities themselves. For those of you who are not aware, Tehran has two shrines of the sons of Imams. The first one is Saleh, the son of Imam Qadim alayhi salam, and the second one is Shah Abdul Azim, who is the son of Imam Hassan alayhi salam. And during the nights of the A'mal, people, the Tehranis, the people of Tehran, they go to these two shrines. One is based in the north, the other one's based in the, in the south, and they perform their A'mal in the confines of the shrines. As I've said before and requested you before, it would be very nice for you at home to send your videos, your pictures to show the rest of the world how you prepare for your day-to-day -day activities in the month of Ramadan. As I've said, it would be interesting to gain an insight into that, to see how your day-to-day -day preparation varies from different people around the world and from country to country. And inshallah, once we get that, we will endeavor to try and air it on Imam Hussein TV. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Dearest Imam Hussain TV viewers Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh One of the most precious stones that, was, that has been recommended by Prophet Muhammad and Ahlul Bayt is the stone of Aqiq It has been said that Aqiq or the mountain that holds within itself the precious stone of Aqiq was the first mountain to believe in God, Prophet Muhammad and Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam Today, we are in one of the stores that sells precious stones. These precious stones turn to ring, and these rings have been recommended by Ahlul Bayt and Prophet Muhammad to be weird during the prayers. Brothers and sisters, we are with the brother Muhammad Reza. He is one of the store owners here in the holy city of Karbala. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam alaikum. Alaikum salam alaikum. Alhamdulillah salam. Can you tell us about the Zawar in this few days for us? In the name of Allah, 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 I also have the name of the world, the name of the world, the name of Allah, and the name of Allah, the name of Allah. In the name of Allah, Alhamdulillah, خیلی طبیعی هستش زائرین همیشه مخصوصا تو ایام زیارتی بیشتر از همه وقت هستن شبای جمعه ماشاءالله بین الحرمین و حرمای عبل فضل علیه السلام و امام حسین یعنی جا به قول معروف جا گیر نمیاد یعنی برای زائر اینطوری هستش uh, brother is saying that uh, the, the status of the visitors to the holy city of Karbala uh, is so normal. Uh, the visitors are coming to the holy city of Karbala and especially uh, on uh, the holidays during the, this holy month. And uh, he's saying that on one of his visits to Bain al-Haramain and the holy shrine of Imam al-Hussein and Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he realized that there is no space and the visitors are occupying all the space.
خب آقای محمد رضا بیشترین سنگایی که شما اینجا دارین چیه و بیشترین سنگایی که مردم ازش استقبال میکنن و بیشتر کدومه بیشترین سنگا معمولا عقیقه یمن هستش که روایت ها بیشتر به این سنگ تاکید شده فیروزه هستش فیروزه نشابور مخصوصا چون فیروزه هم از کشورهای دیگه هم میاد مثل مصر و آمریکا و چین و ولی بیشتر این فیروزه که توصیه شده از اهل بیت علیهم السلام فیروزه نشابوری هستش دور نجف هم که دیگه به قول معروف سوقات کربلا سوقات عراق دور نجف هم خیلی یعنی بازم میشه گفت به نسبت شهرهای کربلا و نجف دور نجف بیشترین فروش رو داره بخاطر همین I asked the brother about the stones and the precious stones that, that they have here in this store. Uh, he's saying that uh, the most valuable and the most precious one is the stone of Aqiq and it is the most famous one amongst uh, all these precious stones. As well as uh, the, the door which is a, a precious stone from the holy city of Najaf. He's saying that uh, in the, both the holy cities of Najaf and Karbala, Aqiq and Dor is the most famous one and people mostly buy these stones. As well, they have a stone which, is, which has come from Neishabur, a city in the holy city of Mashhad, and it is the, one of the most famous stones that comes from Iran. In this segment of the show where we talk about medical advice and health tips, I want to follow on from what we said yesterday about addiction and just talk a little bit about the harmful effects of smoking. As we know, there are many people in our communities who smoke and they find that smoking has become a habit and become an addiction for them. So inshallah, I'll talk to you a little bit about number one, what are the harmful and what effects that smoking has on your, on your health? And secondly, I'll also talk a little bit about how if you want to give up, you can give up. Smoking or cigarettes have many harmful chemicals within them. The main reason why people take the cigarettes is because of the effects of nicotine on their body. Nicotine works on the brain, works on the nicotinic receptors in the brain. And what it does is it affects the frontal lobe. People say that it helps them to calm down, helps them to concentrate. Whilst this may be true, there are also a lot of negative effects of smoking that they must try and understand. How smoking affects pretty much every single organ in the body. How it can have very harmful effects for the heart, for the lungs, for the blood vessels as well that supply the rest of the body. Smoking obviously consists of tobacco. It has tar in it as well. And many, many carcinogens. Carcinogens are those, those chemicals that can cause cancer. And the way it causes cancer is that it oxidizes cells and the free radicals within the chemicals. From a chemistry point of view, they ionize the cells or they can cause changes within the cell uh, infrastructure that can make them cancerous. Apart from that, the actual, the, the, the harmful chemicals and especially the tar, when it ends up in the lungs, it actually stops the, um, the, hell, the hair cells, the ciliary cells within the lungs from moving. And the impact on the design of the ciliary cells, of, of these cells, these hair cells, is to move the mucus up the airway in order for it to clear the lungs, for it to clear the throat. Unfortunately, in smokers, they find that this mechanism doesn't work and the lungs become filled with nasty chemicals, with mucus, and as a result, they find it difficult to breathe. Over a prolonged period of time, the effects of smoking on the lungs are very profound. They can cause changes within the structure of the lung parenchyma, the lung um, cell, the, the structure of the lung itself, and cause something called COPD, which is chronic obstructive um, uh, pulmonary disease, 
which basically means that the actual structure of the lung becomes such that it causes an obstructive pathology, an obstructive problem for, for the person who, who has those diseased lungs. And over a period of time, it can get so bad that it can mean that you're reliant on long-term oxygen therapy. It can even lead to death. As we know, with the profound impact of cigarette smoke on the lungs, the quality of life of those who are on long-term oxygen therapy is very, very poor. And as a result, they must pay heed to the advice that I'm giving about the negative effects of cigarette smoke. Also, the carcinogens, the, the cancer-causing chemicals within the cigarette smoke itself can cause lung cancer. Pretty much everyone who has lung cancer has been exposed to some form of chemical that can cause that lung cancer. So in very, very old people, usually those who are minors, they have cancer caused by the charcoal or the soot within the mines, within the, the lungs of the people who um, were exposed to asbestos. They have cancers caused by the asbestos and people who have been exposed to cigarette smoke can have cancers caused by that cigarette smoke. Now, do not forget that also shisha is within this, this parameter, this spectrum of things that you inhale that can cause diseases of the lungs. So it's very important to also try and avoid shisha if possible. We've covered the lungs. Now let's talk about the heart and other um, parts of the body that can be affected by smoking. Obviously, smoking, because of the chemicals that it contains, the, rather the cigarettes, the chemicals that they contain, these chemicals move around the body within the bloodstream. And what they do is they affect the lining of the blood vessels. So for someone who smokes, for example, the lining of the blood vessels in the heart, the coronary arteries, are extremely small. So these chemicals, they affect and go into the lining of the blood vessels within the wall of the coronary arteries and they start building up plaques. This combined with other risk factors such as maybe diabetes or blood pressure increases the risk of developing heart disease later on in life. But even cigarette by, cigarettes by themselves, they can cause plaque formation and over time, I shall be talking about heart disease and heart attacks in future episode. But just a brief insight into what effects this, this can have on the heart. These plaques become bigger and bigger and over time they can block the coronary artery, hence causing heart attacks or angina. Other parts of the body are affected by cigarette smoke as well. I've done a job in the past within vascular surgery. A lot of people who smoke block their blood vessels in their feet, in their legs, and they get something called claudication. Claudication is basically where the blood vessels within the leg cannot supply enough oxygen to the muscles of the leg especially when you're doing activities such as walking. And this over time can develop into non-healing ulcers, it can develop into gangrene, and can lead to the need of your foot being amputated. I've seen very, very young people who've had their feet amputated simply because they would not give up smoking. And finally, just one of the other organs I want to concentrate on when it comes to the harmful effects of cigarette smoking is the gut. A lot of people who smoke either end up getting or make their inflammatory bowel disease much worse, especially Crohn's disease. And what cigarette smoke does is it makes this inflammatory condition much, much worse. So it's very important. People who smoke find that they eat less because the smoking affects the lining of their stomach. But over time, that cigarette smoke can actually cause precursor or rather predispose you to developing severe pathologies, severe problems with the gut itself. Now that I've talked a little bit about the harmful effects of smoking, let's talk a bit about how you can give up smoking if you wish to do so. The first and most important thing is realizing that smoking actually is harmful to your health and making sure that you want to cut it out of your life because no matter what steps you take, if the willpower isn't there, then you'll never be able to give up. Many people try different things. Some people just stop dead. They just stop straight away and go cold turkey. A lot of people find that, this, that they can do this and that their addiction isn't as profound. However, there are some people who need the nicotine within their system so that it can have an effect. 
And for those people, it's very important to consider trying different types of therapies in order to give up smoking. So one of these therapies could be nicotine replacement therapy. And people have found that using things like patches, uh, electronic cigarettes, or lozenges tends to help. But people who don't think that that actually helps them, they've tried other sort of things, like some people have tried acupuncture or meditation. Some people find that cigarette smoking is more of a social thing for them, so they try to change their habits and their day-to-day -day routine. Some people find that they have a cigarette after, say, breakfast or after lunch, after dinner, and it's not necessarily an addiction, but it's become a force of habit, a part of a routine. So, especially in this month of Ramadan, where you change your daily routine, you change the times that you eat and the times you drink, the times you do things on a day-to-day -day basis, try to also cut smoking out of your day-to-day -day habit. I know a lot of people find that they smoke after they've eaten, so after iftar, try to find something else that you can preoccupy your time with. Try and do du'as and a'mal in order to preoccupy your time. And remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to come close to Him, so focus your attention on that. Inshallah, I pray that this is one of the diseases that we have not only physically, but also affects you spiritually within our community. So, for those who can, it is beneficial to give up so that, inshallah, you can continue to have a long, long, profound impact upon your communities and have longevity of your life, have a good quality of life, because essentially that's the most important things for yourself, for your family, and for the community. Some narrations according to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, regarding narrations about fasting. Verily Allah the Almighty has appointed some angels only in order to pray for the people who fast. Jibra'il has informed me that Allah the Almighty has said, I have not commanded my angels to pray for one of my creatures unless I have accepted the prayers for him or her. The sixth Imam of Ahlul Bayt, Imam al-Sadiq, peace be upon him, states, when a person fasts on a hot day for the sake of Allah and becomes thirsty, Allah the Almighty sends 1,000 angels to touch his or her face and give him or her glad tidings up, up until the time of breaking their fast. When Allah the Almighty tells them, How nice you smell! What a pleasant soul you possess! O my angels, bear witness that I have forgiven him or her. Based on narrations like this, Every, everything that seems bad in this world is not necessarily the same in the hereafter and vice versa. Therefore, although the person who fasts in this month may smell bad in this world or their mouth may have a, smell, a bad smell, however, they have a pleasant odor for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the residents of heaven. On the other hand, according to a, to, according to a very famous tradition narrated by some Sunni and Shia scholars, the Holy Prophet has stated that Allah the Almighty said, Fasting is for me and I am the one who rewards for it. The content in the narration has been widely discussed by, um, uh, by scholars. While all, worship, while, while all worships are for Allah and He is the one who rewards for it. However, why has fasting played a significant role in that narration? We can answer this by three question, We can answer this question by three answers. Number one, the first reason is that fasting is the abandoning of some acts. Thus, this is the only worship that has not been seen and it cannot be seen or known by anyone. Another reason, as suggested by some scholars, is the fact that during the history, all kinds of worship such as prayer, pilgrimage, giving zakat or khums, sacrifice and so on and so forth have been offered to idols and false gods. And the only exception among the acts of worship is fasting, since no one has fasted ever before except for Allah subhanahu except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
In this episode, I want to dedicate the poem and the recital to none other than the personality that's taught us the way of supplicating, who's taught us the art of supplication, that individual from whose teachings we've managed to learn the traits that make us better individuals. He taught us the dua of Makarim al akhlaq and through his life he showed us and guided us to perfection and how to achieve perfection in the human form and spiritual elevation, none other than, none other than Imam Sajjad alayhi salam. This poem was written by me and my brother Abbas. It is dedicated to the qualities of Imam Sajjad and specifically it highlights what we've learned from his life and also from what he, he, he was tested with during Karbala and after Karbala too. You taught us the art of supplication You showed us the power of prostration To make Islam our life's foundation And how to ask Allah for salvation such is your status, so holy soul You made Allah's love your only goal Oh my Imam Oh my Imam Zainul Abidin Oh my Imam Zainul Abidin Oh Sajjad For forty long years you kept on weeping Cause in your mind Sham kept on repeating The lashes you got and all the beating For all these feelings there is no healing Those memories always will be raw Of what you heard, felt and what you saw Oh my Imam Oh my Imam Zainul Abidin Oh my Imam Zainul Abidin Oh Sajjad You are my guidance, my inspiration To emulate you is my intention In every moment, in every second your love will flow in me like an ocean You are the leader of all of man So please give us all a helping hand Oh my Imam Oh my Imam Zainul Abidin Oh my Imam Zainul Abidin Oh Sajjad I want to follow in your direction To fight for truth I will face objection For my beliefs I may face objection For my beliefs I may face rejection I need your help, I need your protection to stand to against stand falsehood against every, day, every day And live my life mastering master your way Oh my Imam Oh my Imam Zainul Abidin Oh my Imam Zainul Abidin Oh Sajjad Imam Ali ibn Musa al rava alayhi salatu wassalam has said, Someone who recites one verse from the Book of Allah, the Mighty, the Glorious, in the month of Ramadan, is like one who has recited the entire Qur'an in the other months.
as we come to the conclusion of this episode, I wanted to leave you with a thought, a philosophy, something that can get you to think and contemplate about life. And it's a saying that I've come across many times. However, I don't know who it's from and who quoted it. But it's a saying that I've implemented in my life many times. So inshallah, I hope it's something that will inspire you as well. The saying is, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. And that is true for everything that you do in life, for every form of action and worship. And even on this path to spiritual elevation, the journey may be long, but no matter what the journey is, it always begins with a single step. And the small steps come together and they make the whole journey. It has been a pleasure to partake in the show and to be here with you. Insha'Allah, I hope that you remember us in your du'as and you also pray for the reappearance of the 12th Imam alayhi salam. Please also don't forget to send us your videos from where you are. And finally, don't forget to join us on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, Instagram and YouTube. Until the next episode, I bid you farewell by saying, Wassalamu alaikum, jamian wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.